Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and today I am thrilled to have with me Jason Mefford. Jason is the podcast host of Jamming with Jason. We're going to talk about his podcast. We're going to talk about uh, internal auditing, and we're going to talk about some, uh, hopefully, some music. So, oh. Jason, first of all, uh, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I always love hanging out with you, Tom. <laughs> so let's start off with uh, your podcast. Uh, yeah. That's actually how I discovered you uh, a couple of years ago, I think, with Jamming with Jason. Mm -hmm. What led you to start that podcast? Has it uh, gone in a direction uh, different than you had anticipated? Or maybe what are some of the two or three biggest surprises you've had in podcasting? Well, it's it's funny. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot, a lot of my career um, after corporate traveling literally all over the world. Um, I would probably, I've got millions of miles on my body. <laughs> and I realized um, pretty quickly after, after being gone, there was one particular trip that I remember. I was gone for 13 straight weeks. So it doesn't seem like that's very long, but that's over three months of being away from my wife <laughs> and my home. And I kind of said, you know, been divorced before, don't want a second divorce. I probably need to figure out ways to do stuff. Uh, and instead of just impacting thousands of people a year, maybe, or a thousand, you know, by showing up and doing live training, what can I do to start helping to spread the message to people literally all over the world, anytime, anywhere, any place kind of thing. And so podcasting was obviously one of those things that fits nicely into this because it's it's an opportunity for people to listen wherever they are, whenever they want to, and be able to spread a message with people anywhere. That's one of the reasons why I started Sea Risk Academy as well, uh, because it's training that's on demand in a similar fashion, because I literally can't be everywhere, right? So, and, um, and what really got me into podcasting was I was... <laughs> I, I kind of have a rule that when I hear something two or three times, I need to listen, right? And so I had several people that said, you know, Jason, you've you've got a great radio voice. Have you ever done radio? And um, and I was sitting at a, it was a National Speakers Association conference several years ago. And, um, and somebody said, have you been on the radio? Because your voice is just amazing. And this was a person who was on radio. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So maybe this is one of the ways that I'm supposed to help people and show up. And so um, just started and realized that podcasting was something that I enjoyed, um, that I wanted to do. And so I jumped into it. And, um, you know, a lot of it to begin with has been kind of technical because I've got a background in audit and risk and compliance. Uh, and so talking about some of those things and, and kind of shaking, shaking people a little bit, because sometimes we we get into this um, kind of hypnotic trance of what we're doing. And sometimes we don't stop to step back and kind of shake our head and say, why am I doing this? So part of it is to kind of, you know, uh, spread that message a little bit. But as I've done now, I think I've got about 200 episodes of, of that one. Plus, I do another podcast with one of my friends. We've got about 150 episodes over there. Um, realize that there's kind of some themes of what I help people do, which is around leadership and learning, you know, career development, helping people get ahead, acquire the knowledge, skills, and competencies that they need to move their career to the next level, um, but also from a leadership perspective. Because a lot of a lot of what's taught, especially in corporate America, is command and control leadership, which is like many dictators kind of running around telling everybody what to do, uh, and that there's actually other ways that are much more effective uh, from a leadership perspective. And so, you know, slowly over time, I've been kind of transitioning more to those are kind of my main topics. And I do some things that are a little different, like every so often I'll pull out my guitar and I'll actually play part of a song um, as part of the podcast. And I just did it because I like doing it, but I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that they they really enjoy that. So I'm not a professional musician, I'm, I'm but people are just jamming with me, um, which is why I came up with that, because I've always had a big affinity for music. 
So there we go. That's part of the backstory, right? <laughs> so what are two or three of the biggest uh, surprises uh, that you've stumbled across in podcasting? Um, I, I guess one of the surprises is just, you know, especially being a professional speaker, you know, you're always supposed to be so polished and practiced and everything. And what I found is a lot of the episodes that resonate the most with people are just when I click hit, I just click record and I just start talking and it's not necessarily scripted. It's just me talking from the heart. Um, and I make mistakes, <laughs> you know, like when I'm playing the guitar, I'll, if people are listening, they'll tell when I make a mistake, but it doesn't matter. And so just, just showing up and being me, uh, is what people want. Right. And, and like I said, you know, to the topics, um, over time, sometimes I'll record a podcast with a, with a, 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 you know, a guest. And I think, man, this is a huge person in the industry. Lots of people are going to want to listen to this. And it's like crickets and other ones where it's like, I just put something out there just because maybe I'm running up on the deadline and I just have to hit record and go. And it's like, those are the ones that people love. So it's been kind of interesting that way. Yeah, that uh, has always amazed me. You just really have no idea what's going to resonate or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, um, and it, and it, well, go ahead. I was, was going to say, you know, because early on I, 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 I named it Jamming with Jason. I didn't call it the Internal Audit Podcast or something like that because I, I wanted to be able to have the ability to make it be whatever I feel like talking about but I wanted it kind of intimate as if, as if it was a couple of, you know, hack musicians just sitting around jamming together and talking and having a good time um, and, and pulling that music side of it because people just love music. The top downloaded videos on YouTube are all music videos, which just kind of blows me away. But people love music. So I love music. So I'm going to talk about it. And I always like, Tying stuff in when we can. So I just had a uh, birthday and my wife got me a turntable. And uh, so I was able to break out albums oh. I've been hauling around for 20 years. And she said, uh, you know, I don't think I've seen you grin this much since our wedding day. So uh, I know. Well, and it's, and it's like they stopped selling turntables for a while. And so I was one of the stupid ones that got rid of all my vinyl at that right. point. And now they're selling them again. It's like, I wish I had some of those old ones, but. Say lovey. Say lovey. So we've had the chance to visit a couple of times. And one of the themes that I think we have talked about is the disconnect of different types of compliance. I was on a webinar this morning and someone said still one of the biggest challenges for a compliance officer is access to data, but more importantly, being disconnected from the control system that a company might have. And, and you've, I think, both talked about and written about unified compliance. So I was wondering if we might be able to explore that, see how that can perhaps help us move away from this disconnected compliance and how that can really benefit not simply a compliance function, but really the entire business organization to make it, make the controls and processes more efficient and hopefully lead to, uh, to greater profitability. So what is unified compliance and how can we move towards that? Yeah, so it's, you know, when I was when I was a chief compliance officer, I actually used their product, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So this is a company that's they've been around for almost 20 years now. Um, and it, it goes back to kind of one of those challenges that, you know, because we were both involved with OSEG many years ago as well, too. And the whole idea of the GRC movement and going from silos to actually being connected kind of across the organization and understanding what what everybody's doing, right? There's still that need today. And, and what Unified Compliance started doing was they said, you know what, there's a lot of these regulations, and, and I'll call them either, either mandatory compliance things, so laws, regulations that you have to do to do business, but there's, there was becoming a lot of these, what I call voluntary compliance things. So ISO standards, NIST, some of these other things that, especially because of third party risk, have become 
something you kind of have to do. It's not a law, but your business partners are requiring you to do it. And so everybody started coming out with these frameworks and standards or the regulations. And as you stood back, you started to realize it seems like most of these people are asking us to do the same thing, but they're using different words, right? And so for a company to go through and try to figure out, first off, what the hell they're asking you to do takes thousands of hours, right? Because you've got to read something written by a lawyer or by a politician or by some committee of experts who, you know, <laughs> I've been on those committees. They argue about certain words, right? And, and what those words actually mean. And so they started looking at that and saying, you know what? We can actually, um, they actually started working with one of the big law firms here in the U.S. to say, isn't there a way that we could make compliance easier for people? What if we could figure out and define what all of these terms and words mean? If we could look at the nouns and verbs that were used in, in, in these documents and understand what's something practical that as a company I can do to comply with this and get, a, get away from all of the overlap. Because that disconnection that you talked about, you know, what you find is a lot of times five different groups within an organization go, oh, I need to comply with X, Y, Z, right? They all realize we got to comply with X, Y, Z. So each group puts controls or processes in place and creates duplication. And effectively, the organization's got five controls when they really only need one. And so what unified compliance helps is, is it takes away those thousands of hours that people are usually spending trying to figure everything out and gives you a consolidated deduplicated list of here's the things I want to comply with. What are the controls I would need to do to comply with all of those documents? And so literally it saves thousands of hours of work. And for most companies, it's only a 10 or $15,000 investment which is way better than spending, you know, so much time internally or hiring somebody else to come in and help you understand it. Plus the way that they've got it set up, you can actually go directly back to the authoritative document and know I'm doing this control because I'm asked to do it in this particular citation reference in that document. So it's, 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 it's pretty slick. And like I said, I was on the phone this morning with two, two different companies about that. And one of the guys, the chief compliance officer for their IT function. And he's like, man, where have you been all my life? Well, <laughs> they've been around. Nobody just knows about them. So that's why I thought I'd you know share with your audience because I, I know this is one of those groups where people are overworked. You know, they're they're putting in lots of hours trying to comply with everything. And there's an easier way to do it. Right. I mean, you can the analogy I like to use is you can, you know, if you need to have a car to get from point A to point B, you can go out and you can build yourself one of those fancy DeLoreans like in Back to the Future. And it's going to cost you a million, two million dollars to do. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be unique to just you. Or you can just go buy a workhorse vehicle like a Toyota Camry for $30,000, it's still going to get you from point A to point B. And I think most companies, they just need the Camry. They don't need the DeLorean. So you might as well utilize what somebody else has already done and what's already become kind of a, a standard practice and accepted and used by most of the big companies in the world. Jason, one of my observations during the height of the pandemic last year was that uh, changes that have been kind of percolating around in 2018, 2019, uh, accelerated sometimes exponentially. Uh, I had one colleague say mm -hmm. we had five years of change last year. And one of those areas of change was in, uh, in risk. Not only did risk change, but I also saw, I I'd, I'd heard in 18 and 19, people talking about a unified theory of risk or unified risk within a business organization. And that seemed to be one of the concepts that really resonated last year. Guys, it's not compliance risk. It's not AML risk. It's not a cyber risk. It's not security risk. It's not people risk. It's risk. And how do we uniformly and in a unified man manner 
manage that risk? Is that something that, uh, that you have, have seen uh, uh, percolate as well? And does that really resonate with internal audit professionals like I'm beginning to see it percolate <laughs> or rather uh, uh, really resonate with uh, corruption profession, uh, anti-compliance corruption professionals? Well, it's it's something that we we have been talking about for a long time. It's it's interesting because I mean, risk is risk, like you said, and and we do we've got different categories, and so again, a lot of times what's happened is organizations say we've got this really big thing called risk, right? Now let's start figuring out, let's categorize it. Okay, these financial risks, CFO, you're responsible for those things, right? Uh, you know, corruption, AML, all right, you know, legal, you're responsible for that, right? And so we start, we've got these different categories of risk that certain individuals are primarily responsible for. But just like we've done for eons in, in corporate world is we go away and we do it on our own. And we don't include other people. I mean, that's that's one of the pr the principles, um, you know, from ISO thirty one thousand is risk should be an inclusive and transparent process. So we should be talking to other people within the organization, because what ends up happening if you don't do that, uh, one group may be managing the risk for them but by them managing that risk in the particular way they're doing it, it increases the risk for the rest of the organization. So let me, I'll give you an example of that. One of the companies where I worked, we had our, our operations managers, we bought a lot of natural gas to run our factories. So much so that we would buy derivatives and we would get you know forward contracts on natural gas. We used marketing companies to help us manage the price fluctuation. Because this was at a time, too, when natural gas prices were going crazy. They were kind of correlating with the increase in, in um, petroleum prices that were going crazy at the time. And so we had our, our operations team that came back and said, you know what, I want to manage this better. And I've, I've managed, I think, I think at the time, we, they had budgeted to spend $5 in MMBTU on gas. Now they came back to us and said, "Well, we've got this marketing company that will that will promise us a 450 price if we sign this contract for the rest of our capacity." So for them, they wanted to manage their budget risk, right? And say, "Look, I budgeted for 5. I want to lock in 4 and a half. Why? Because I'm going to save money, I'm going to make more money in my particular part of the company." that's going to lead me to get my bonus at the end of the year. But again, when we, when we looked at that from a corporate perspective, we said, no, 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 it, it might benefit you, but locking in 100% of our natural gas for the year is riskier than the current you know, method that we're taking. And so that's, again, where that you know, disconnected compliance, disconnected risk, we, you've got to get the right people talking together um, and get them in the same room because you you end up finding that a lot. A well-intentioned person who thinks they're managing risk in their area may actually be increasing the risk for the rest of the organization. And, you know, again, internal audits trying to come along. You know, we're having a lot of people even outside of business are using the word risk much more than they ever did before. Uh, but we, we just got to start having these discussions together because, everybody brings a little different perspective and we need to think about what's best at the consolidated or top level within the organization. So we often talk about, and perhaps one of the most ubiquitous phrases in compliance is tone at the top. How do you have that mm -hmm. conversation about risk at the top? Is it simply we are risk averse? We are willing to accept risks with management we, are, uh, we want to see what the risk management strategy is. How do you, uh, if you were going to counsel a board of directors to think about risk, how would you begin that discussion with them? 
Well, part of it is we have different risk av aversion levels for different things. And so that's why one of the things in risk that you, you tend to do, and this is on the governance of risk side, is you will come up with what I usually call uh, like a risk criteria or guidelines. And so some of the terms that people use are things like risk appetite, risk tolerance. Those are some words that, that a lot of people throw around. And so really from a governance perspective, and so tone at the top is really talking from a board perspective and from the C-level executives. Each organization has a certain appetite for certain kinds of risks. And it's going to be different from organization to organization. So some organizations are willing to take on much more risk, which is fine. You document that, you know, the, the kinds of things that you're willing to do um, and the levels at which you're willing to kind of take on those risks. And so this can be translated even to compliance as well, because I know a lot of companies will say, well, I know I'm supposed to comply with that, but I'm not going to. Why? Because we don't think it's a big deal. And even if we get in trouble for it, we're willing to risk paying that fine because it makes business sense to us. Okay, so on the, on the one hand, they might say something like that. Now, but because, again, we're talking about different kinds of risks, they might be willing to accept that financial risk of the penalty, but they also have to consider what's the reputational risk that goes along with that too. Because, you know, it might make sense like, hey, $2 million, who cares? I can pay that fine easily. But if it ends up having a reputational impact to you as well, and your stock price tumbles by 20% because you're the bad child on Wall Street Journal, then, you know, sometimes you're not, again, that's that disconnected view. You think you can afford the $2 million, but you can't afford the $5 billion market loss. Right. And so people have got to talk about that and realize that these things are interconnected and do have some of these multiple impacts. But again, governance wise, you just got to know what I'm comfortable with. And again, a lot of times, you know, companies can't say these things publicly. Now that I'm not an executive, I can say these things publicly. <clears throat> but a lot of times there will be discussions like, you know what, we can, we can afford, quote unquote, to have five people die this year, right? We can, because especially in, in some environments, your employees are going to die. That's, that's just a part of, of some of the risk that you take on in some of these endeavors. Now, publicly, they're never going to say we're okay if only five people die, because when somebody dies, it's a big deal. That can also be a reputational issue as well, right? But these discussions are going on, you know, even to the point like, hey, geopolitical issues, right? You know, and you know this from, from an AML or from a corruption standpoint, some companies will choose not to do business in certain countries. That's a risk governance thing that they've set down and said, you know what, we're not going to do business in that country because we know the risk of corruption is high. In fact, to do business in that country, you really have to do more than facilitating payments to get anything done. So, you know, they, they should have those discussions and consciously decide we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. And those are the kinds of discussions that should be happening at the board and the executive level and make sure that both of those groups are aligned on what the appropriate risk levels are. And then how do you communicate that? discussion or that tone from the board senior management down through mid middle management and even to the tactical level. Yeah. So typically the way that you'll see that happen, and, and this is, this is where and why people talk about tone at the top, because often people will say one thing and do something different. And so typically how you do it is, is you would say something like, okay, maybe we can accept a $10 million risk in this particular area. Now we're going to operationalize that. And this is where things like levels of authority policies come into place. So, you know, at a, at a corporate level, maybe we can handle a $10 million exposure, but Tom, in your part of the business, we're going to give you a $2 million 
authority limit, right? Because we know that even if something goes wrong in your area, it shouldn't get up to our $10 million limit, let's say. And so that's sometimes how it's it's operationally rolled out. That's why you give people certain authority limits because in, in the further down you go in the organization, it gets smaller and smaller because you know you don't want things to roll up to be to be too big. So that's kind of one of the ways that you kind of operationalize these decisions is by giving people limits around the kinds of decisions they can make or the kinds of decisions they can't make. And if it's, you know, if it's a decision that's above, so, so let's say you wanted to enter into something and you looked at it and you said, hmm, we could have a $5 million exposure here. That's more than my $2 million. So you'd have to go to your boss and say, look, I still want to do this. Let me explain this. Maybe you have that authority level and you can say, you're right, Tom. I understand we're taking on a little bit more risk. I understand that. I see what you're doing. I see what everybody else is doing. I'm okay with it. Go ahead right? Because we're not going to exceed it at the top level. Where the tone at the top always comes in is when people, um, usually the executives don't act the way that they're talking. And so it's, it's in what happens there and why that can be so dangerous is if I'm a subordinate, right? And, and you're the boss and you're telling me, you know, you need to do this. You can only do blah, 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 blah. But then I watch your behavior. If your behavior is different than what you're telling me to do, I'm probably going to rationalize and say, screw it. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not taught, they're not walking their talk. So why should I do what they want me to do? That's where tone at the top really comes in. And it, it has to be, you know, I, I remember, one example, it was, we, we were doing some um, executive comp or uh, sorry, uh, executive t &E, travel and entertainment audits. And our board had asked us to do it because they wanted to make sure that our executives were being ethical, right? You cheat on your expense report, you're probably cheating somewhere else. And so I remember, you know, we found this one guy, it was pretty egregious. Uh, very quickly, we saw that he'd stolen between 50 and a hundred thousand dollars. So easy, boom, you're fired, you know, local police, here's the file. We want to prosecute this guy. Uh, there was another executive that we looked at again very quickly. It was, it was smaller amounts. I mean, he was doing really stupid stuff, but it was only maybe a thousand dollars. And I remember going back to this, to the, um, to the VP that was responsible for this man. And he said, well, I'm not going to fire him because it's only $1,000. And I said, well, I understand it's only $1,000, but this is what it's saying, right? He's like, nope, I'm not going to do it. So I had to go back to our CEO and say, <laughs> you know, I just talked to this VP and he says, nope, not going to do it. And my CEO said, don't worry, I'm on the company plane with him this afternoon. Before we land, it will be taken care of. Right. Because this VP was looking at it and saying, oh, it's only a thousand dollars. And, oh, you know, we just promoted this guy to a national sales role. We just did all of these press releases over it. Now it's going to look really weird for us to all of a sudden fire him. Right. But the CEO, he was the one that set that tone. And he said, I don't care whether it's two dollars. If one of our executives is stealing from the company, even two dollars, I don't want that person working for our company. So he held that tone, but he was, he was one of those guys that, that did walk his talk. And a lot of times, unfortunately in corporate America, not all the executives walk their talk. And so that's why people keep bringing up this tone at the top stuff is we've got to be consistent in what we say and in what we do. Slippery uh, slope though. <laughs> Jason, unfortunately, we're getting near the end of our time for this episode, but uh, I did want to visit with you a little bit about some music questions. And I know I sent you some questions, mm -hmm. but I've decided I want to ask some other ones. So, uh, <laughs> dang, I've prepared for this. <laughs> so, the uh, a few weeks ago, my daughter texts me and says, uh, Give me your uh, top five concerts you've ever gone to. 
And I started thinking about it. And um, I had a hiatus of going to concerts for about 30 years, Mm self-imposed. And um, so my concert going career really broke down to sort of high school, college, grad school, law school, stop, and then picking up again uh, in my 50s. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a very different experience uh, at older. And so I told her, I said, well, I have to give two lists um, because it's two really two separate parts of my life. And um, when I started thinking about the, when I started going back to shows about 10 years ago, it was uh, many of the mu- musicians are, are older, somewhere, somewhere in their 80s then, and, and some are in their 80s now. And, you know, it's kind of like the birth rate in the 1600s. If, if you were in rock and roll and you got past your 30s, you could get a good chance for living a long <laughs> life. And, and some of these guys, you know, they don't need the money and they may enjoy the ad- adulation, but they just enjoy performing. And that's what I really yeah. observe this time around is, is guys and gals who want to go out there and just and rock out and sing and play. And that was not, you know, what I was experiencing really uh, when I was younger. But I was so I wanted to ask uh, kind of what's the difference in your uh, experience now and going to a, a concert as opposed to uh, perhaps when you were in college or l- at least younger? Yeah, no, I, th- I think it's kind of what you described there is similar to me. You know, when we're when we're younger, we're just excited. Oh, it's the Eagles or, oh, it's the whoever, right, that we happen to be enamored with at that particular time. And so so it's more about saying we went, right? And, and yeah, it's fun. You kind of rock out, you know, during it. But as we get older, we mature and we appreciate different things, I think, as well. Right. And so now for me, it, it's like you said, there's there's a lot of people I appreciate the not only the musicianship. OK, but but it, but it's not even just that, you know, I, I would sit and, and, and just watch people playing the guitar. Right. You know, while everybody else is doing other stuff, I'm focused in on like the, the craft of right. the music and watching what they're doing right but but even even more than that i think it's it's the there there is a big difference in kind of the authenticity behind it and so what i mean is you know there's some people you can tell that are just there for the money they show up they kind of play their stuff they get off the stage as soon as they can okay Right. The music might have been good, but it's a different feel to it than somebody who is really a performer and is there for the love of their fans. Right. Like you said, some of these people, they got more money than God. They don't need to keep they don't need to keep playing. Why do they keep playing? Because of the joy that they're providing to other people. And so, you know, when, when you look at that, it's like, you know, some of the best concerts I've gone to, Foo Fighters. Man, those guys brought it for three hours. And, and you could just tell they were loving it, right? I mean, it was, it was um, the last one that I went to was actually when Dave Grohl broke his, broke his ankle or broke his leg. He called it the Broken Foot Tour or something like that because he... Uh, he, he was doing something, danced around, and somehow broke his broke his ankle or something. Well, he they continued, right? So most musicians would have said, oh, I broke my ankle. I got to sit at home. No, not Dave Grohl, right? He's like, put a cast on that, and let's just keep going, right? And so he they modified it. He had to sit down for most of the concert. But he, he might have been sitting, but he wasn't sitting, <laughs> right, the whole time. And, and they just brought it. They brought it. You know, somebody else that that does that, Garth Brooks, right? I mean, you, you may or may not like his music. That man loves his fans. And if you've ever been, if you want to go to a concert, go to a Garth Brooks concert and see some of the stuff that he does and some of the, the individual caring 
that he does for people. He'll take off his guitar and hand it to somebody in the audience as a gift. You know, he'll bring people up on stage. I, I remember seeing, there's some great YouTube videos of him. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of times the, the forgotten people. So he was, it was, it was walking, it was a concessions person or something like that, that was kind of off to the side and, and kind of having a good time. And he went and brought her up on the stage with him, you know, I mean, things like that to where it's, it's that authenticity, that caring and that performing and giving it back. You can tell who are the true performers because, you know, a lot of times they won't want to play their popular music. So this is true, especially now with a lot of these bands we're going to see because they've been around for 40, 50 years, right? And it's like, how many more times do I have to play Sympathy for the Devil or whatever it is, right? I played this song 10,000 times, but it's the people who love doing it each time. Even though they played it, it's not for them. It's for the audience. Those are the, those are the ones that are memorable. And it's really in everything that we do. So... I hope I'm showing up that way for my podcast too, right? Is that it's, I don't need to hear myself talk. You know, I'm here to help other people that are out there and just bring it each time that I'm doing whatever I happen to be doing. Well, Jason, we are at our end now. And as always, it's been a ton of fun and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Sounds good. Thanks, Tom.